So we're back. Welcome, everyone. Um, if you joined us after that started, you might have wondered if you were in the right place. Um, a little background on, on that um, uh, the video. Uh, this week coming up, um, well, let's say, I think we're all familiar with uh, climate crisis and probably familiar with the um, meeting coming up in Glasgow, Scotland in a few weeks, um, kind of the next steps of what we, what, um, what we can do collectively um, around uh, climate change. And um, that, that uh, video was put together by a group, 150 um, musicians, I think from Glasgow or around there, uh, that area and uh, to, you know, as part of the, the effort really overall around climate change. And this coming week here in Washington, we have a week of action. I shared something of that in, the, um, in a message I sent out, uh, including um, somewhere around 100 or 100 and some um, faith, multi-faith delegation of faith leaders at the invitation of indigenous leaders and people um, taking action um, to put pressure on the administration to kind of follow through on the commitments around, you know, the steps to be taken around climate change. So um, I think most of them, and I'm included in that, will be risking arrest on Tuesday morning to, you know, you know to share our concern about um, around climate change and, and, and necessary action around that. So that was just a little background on that. And I will share the, um, the link um, to that. Um, and I will, when, as soon as a moment comes up when I can um, put, put the link in the chat, I will do that. Um, so with all of that, Welcome everyone, hope you are having a good weekend and um, had a good week. Hope things are going well for you, you're staying, staying healthy. Good to see everyone, lots of familiar faces and um, please let us know if you're new so we can give you a particularly warm welcome if anyone is here for the first time or the second time. Uh, um, Nice, nice to see everyone and great to have everyone who's joining from outside of our immediate um, metro area, Washington, um, DC and, uh, and Maryland and Virginia. And uh, if Kerry is with us today and anyone else from the North, from Canada, uh, happy Thanksgiving day, happy Canadian Thanksgiving day tomorrow. Um, so wishing everyone well in, in Canada. And, uh, I, um, and also um, for um, mental health, I think month, isn't it? Mental health month. And so it's an, another to uh, be conscious of as well. Um, I, don't know, I guess you, you say happy mental health month, um, whatever the <laughs> appropriate uh, thing one says, but anyway, but just to, Hold, hold those who are um, suffering in uh, different conditions and challenges um, in, in our hearts today and this month. So welcome. Um, I am Hugh Byrne and I'm part of the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, teacher here for almost 20 years and with uh, the Center for Mindful Living. And many of you are also very much a part of, which is part of, uh, of the of IMCW. And uh, welcome to this um, Sunday morning session. We've been doing these in one way or another for over 20 years now. So it's uh, um, Sunday morning brings me back to my duties, as it were. I'm kind of like, okay, this is time for us to be together and, and uh, be back in Sangha and, and all the other opportunities we have as well. So what, I, what I'm gonna be talking about today is um, 
in the talk is, is why is speech our communications? And uh, it's an area of extraordinary importance in our lives, isn't it? You know, our speech, it can be a cause of great joy, you know, expressing love and connection and care and love of the earth and love of connection with others, but it can also be a, an area of, of great pain and suffering, I think, as we know in our political world today, you know, around how words are used to very often to divide us, to create divisions, to, to create falsehoods, to create, you know, quote, alternative facts, alternative realities, and, and, and essentially to divide us in order to benefit, you know, benefit, you know, in the name of, of greed and in the name of fear, unfortunately. And so um, I'd like for us to explore that uh, um, today, or at least a little bit of it. It's a huge, huge area, but to, um, to take some time to reflect on that today. And, um, and what, just in terms of the format, what, typically what we do is, um, yeah, thank you, Bettina. Regina spoke about the visiting force of all or nothing thinking yeah yeah oh yeah Francine's question there so what we'll do we'll begin with a meditation we'll then move into some share I'll share some reflections on wise speech wise communication and then we'll um, we'll have some time for sharing depending on the time either in groups or in pairs or in the full group, and then and close with a final meditation. So please um, feel free if, you know, particularly outside of the meditation to share anything that comes up for you, any, anything that uh, is arising and also any questions that you might have. Obviously during the meditation, it's good for us to be focused on the meditation. Um, um, so with that, let's, uh, let's begin and I invite you to uh, wherever you are and people, most of us are in our own spaces, but some, you know, some may join us in some other venue, you know, maybe some, some, sometimes people are out walking, you know, and listening while they're while they're walking. So wherever you are, just take this a few moments to arrive and settle. So if you're sitting, just find a posture that's comfortable, relaxed, at ease. Let your attention drop down out of the thinking mode. Just come down into the body. Feel the contact with the surface beneath you. Feel your buttocks, your thighs, touching the chair or the cushion. If you were walking, feel your feet touching and lifting them and moving them. Feel them touching the floor. Just inviting the shoulders to relax. Let the chest be be open so you can breathe easily. <clears throat> Just establish a posture that's comfortable, relaxed, with a sense of dignity. You know, our posture has a big effect on, on our mind, you know, our mental state, our, if the body is is really focused and present, the mind will tend to, to settle more too, and of course, vice versa. So any adjustments to, to be as comfortable as you can be. You could let your attention come to your breathing. First, just notice how it is. 
the breath is a great barometer of our overall kind of state of being, how we're doing. You know, if we're stressed, the breath tends to be very tight, contracted. And when we're relaxed and at ease, the breath tends to be deeper, fuller. So just noticing can be helpful. And then you might consciously deepen the breath as a way of helping yourself relax and be here. So take a nice full deep in breath, filling the lungs, filling the chest. Just hold for a moment and then release. Long, slow out breath. Really letting all of the breath be released and then breathing in again. You might do take a few of these longer, fuller, deeper breaths. Letting the breath help you settle and arrive. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. You might at the same time invite a smile to your face. Again, the smile sends a message to our nervous system, to the brain that we can, that we can relax, we can let our guard down. When we're often in a tight, vigilant place, worried, stressed, anxious, to see if we can let go of that. <coughs> Excuse me. thinking of someone who makes you feel happy or joyful, if that's helpful. Just letting their image come to your heart and mind. Just take in that smile if you can. We can come back, come back to the smile at any time. If we're feeling stressed or worried, just invite the smile can come back to the deeper breathing too. And just the simple gesture of putting your hand on your heart, maybe the other hand on the belly, can also help us relax, settle. Particularly if we're dealing with anything that's difficult or painful. Whenever, whenever you're ready, just letting yourself, letting your attention open to, to whatever is present right now in the body, in the heart, in the mind. whatever bodily feelings you're aware of. Just let them come, let them go. Without resistance, without holding on, without judging yourself. Just with kindness, with care. Opening to whatever bodily feelings are present. whatever mood or emotions may be here right now, or mind states, 
Now you might be feeling a little bit tired or restless or calm, peaceful. See if you can welcome the guests, whatever, whatever's here. See how it is to just make room, make space for what's here. However the mind is right now, whether it's settled, calm, or more worried or agitated. See if you can just be aware of the thoughts come up, maybe pull you in a particular direction, and just let them, let them come and go. Just come back to your body, come back to your breathing. Come back to this moment. Inviting an attitude of, of kindness and acceptance to whatever is present, whatever's arising for you in the body and the mind and the heart. Whatever's here, it's like this. It's like this. As Rumi's poem says, the dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be, be, be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. <clears throat> So if the metaphor of the guests is a helpful one, just letting the guests come and go, whatever your guests are today at this time. Meeting what's present with kindness, with care without judging or resisting. And if judging or resisting come up, see if you can meet the judging and resisting without judging or resisting. So letting the container as it were of compassionate awareness be large enough to hold whatever's here The mind often wants to make an exception. You know, we get the theory of welcome the guests, but then when something kind of maybe particularly unpleasant or difficult comes up, we say, not this, or not now. So how is it to say yes to this and yes to now? 
just share a poem I think I've shared once before. This is from Muhyiddin Ibn al-Arabi. There was a time I would reject those who were not of my faith, but now my heart has grown capable of taking on all forms. It is a pasture for gazelles, an abbey for monks, a table for the Torah, Kaaba for the pilgrim. My religion is love. Whichever the route love's caravan shall take, that shall be the path of my faith. Whichever the route love's caravan shall take, that shall be the path of my faith. So if it's helpful, letting your attention rest on your breathing as a, as a kind of anchor for your awareness, a home base. It's where you can rest your attention and you know you can come back, keep coming back. You know, it could be the breath, it could be the body, bodily feelings, it could be sounds, whatever helps you to be here. It's this present moment awareness, moment to moment. Just this moment, the, uh, the mind also tends to think, or we sometimes argue that this, I can't be with this because it's going to, to last forever or for a very long time. You know, it's one of the illusions we, the mind creates filling in the dots of the future. But the invitation is not to say yes so much to forever or the next five years or whatever, but just this moment, just this breath, just this feeling, this emotion. Can I be with this? It makes it very simple but not necessarily easy because this may not be easy. <clears throat> but simply saying yes to this, finding peace in the midst of whatever, whatever is present.
coming back to the words of Dorothy Hunt, peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. <clears throat> Just experiencing us here together today, here in held in community. With a shared aspiration, shared wish to, to live more kindly, more wisely, to wake up more fully. You might, in a, a variation of a Tibetan Tonglen practice, just breathe in a wish of kindness to yourself. And breathe out a wish of kindness and compassion to everyone who's here, all of us here. May you be safe and happy, filled with loving kindness. May I be happy, may I be free from suffering. May I be kind to myself. And this is uh, a poem to finish from our dear late friend, poet Mary Oliver, called I Worried. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it and I'm, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang.
is the more familiar bell. It's hidden under a tissue. So welcome everyone. Good to, uh, if you joined us uh, during the meditation, um, welcome to you. And uh, see how we're doing. I actually probably have two talks today, so I'm just gonna see where we go with them. Maybe I'll do the second part next week. But the, <clears throat> The theme for today is um, wise speech, wise communication, which is a um, very central theme in the, um, in, the, in the Buddhist teachings and in, in our lives, as we know, and in, in every, every tradition, really. You know, we're all told pretty much, you know, don't tell lies, don't, you know, don't use angry words, whatever. Not that it's, people always comply with it, but those kind of commandments or admonitions or whatever. And, uh, and similarly in the Buddhist tradition, it's, it's treated, you know, really um, as something that's, that's really important. And it has a very interesting role. I say, say something about that. But first to say that, you know, something that's obvious, I think, to all of us, and that is that, our speech and our communications make a huge difference in our lives and in our, in our world. You know, there we connect with others as we're connecting today largely, I mean, through speech and through not just speech, but, you know, I'm sharing with you and, you know, you may be sharing um, through maybe not words, but maybe through you know, through your gestures or through smiles or through other ways, which are forms of speech, you know, forms of communication as well. Um, and as well as obviously the chat, um, which, you know, it's the you know, form of communication. So, so our speech, our communication is fundamental to how we connect with others, how we express joy and love and anger, express how we're feeling. You know, it's a big part of how we, how we work for, for change in the world, you know, you know, on on demonstrations like you know the women's march uh, last week or the climate change, you know, it's through words that we say, you know, we want something different, you know, it's through words, through communications, how we get our information about what's going on, you know, what happened in Congress, what happened in in Poland this week, what happened, you know, in Afghanistan or whatever. Um, you know, our words and our communications, you know, are an important part of how we live together, you know, in terms of our legislation through the laws and all of that. Um, and our speech takes many, many different forms, you know, obviously the vocal speech, but also writing, gestures, songs, you know, that the song and the, the music we heard at the beginning was, was speech, you know, it was conveying something, you know. You know, and then there's there's all the online stuff, you know, the posting, you know, in the Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all of that, um, emails, and uh, and and even silence, you know, can be a form of speech. It can be a form of communication. You know, just you know, the Buddha was asked if he, you know, what do we do if we, you know, if we if we don't know something, you know, then keep silent, he said, you know, so that silence is a, is a form of speech in that way, a kind of a negative or an absence of speech. And another thing to say is that, you know, that I think is we all know well is that our speech, our communication can do great good and also cause terrible harm. As I was thinking about this this week, you know, I think of, you know, I think of, um, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Um, you know, I, I come back to, you know, some lines from 
one of the speech speeches where he says he says to to segregationists you know supporters of jim crow and race racism and white supremacy in the in the south but other places too he says i've seen too much hate to want to hate he goes on to say do to us what you will and we will still love you and one day we will win our freedom we will not only win freedom for ourselves we will appeal to your heart and conscience and our victory will be a double victory so it was the idea there of using words not to separate not right or wrong but to say we're all part of the same community and our actions are designed not just to free ourselves you know people of color but free white people who are caught up in delusion too so that the, the words are were, you know you know beautiful heart opening words um, that change hearts and minds and not just those words but the actions the non-violent actions were taken brought about profound changes you know in in the society and you know as as we know i mean far from far from enough far from done but but fundamental nonetheless you think of um you know nelson mandela in in south africa and and his speech and his actions to you know how the role that forgiveness played and compassion played in uh, in helping create a multiracial democracy in South Africa out of a, you know, a, an apartheid white supremacist uh, state. Um, and in our own lives, I think we all know we've, we've, we can think of how our words have caused harm, you know, when we've, when we've, uh, when we've said things and then, oh God, I wish I hadn't said that. And other times where we feel really good, like, I'm, yeah, I really, that's really what I wanted to convey. And I felt it was helpful and, you know, and we see on a kind of a larger scale, I mean, just to mention some of the things that are in our news every day, in the news every day, you know, people dying of COVID, um, you know, based on believing falsehoods about vaccinations, you know. Um, so their words are used to distort and dis to misinform people and then people take action and, you know, and some people die on that basis. You know, people attacked the Capitol on January 6th on the basis of words. You know, there was a quote stolen election, so we've got to do it. People died. People are now serving prison sentences, you know, or, or fine, paying fines for, for their actions based on, based on their lies and angry, hateful speech. Um, you know, this week, you know, we saw the news about um, um, the Facebook um, um, whistleblower, Haugen, I thought it was Karen, Carolyn, Kristen. I can't remember her first name, but the sharing about uh, about Facebook and Instagram, and the way that young girls were harming themselves because of bullying on Instagram, or were becoming depressed, or are becoming depressed because their bodies don't fit the ideal presented there. You know, those are all ways in which speech and communications are used in harmful ways. You know, maybe it's not always deliberate, but it you know it can still still be harmful it can be reckless it can be negligent and then we have situations you know which are so so extreme and so and so aware of you know the genocide in rwanda you know where words were really used to pit you know one ethnic group against another you know the word that was by the hutu um you know, rulers and, and people supporting their rule um, was cockroaches, you know, co co talking about Tutsis and people who supported them as cockroaches, creating fear. You know. We see that, we see it in, in Myanmar, an ostensibly Buddhist country, you know, the, the genocide of the uh, Rohingya people, you know, and of course, Nazi Germany, how speech was used to ferment fear and hatred, le leading to millions being, being murdered. 
millions of Jews and, and others who were seen as enemies of the regime. Um, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's a wonderful, wonderful monk and teacher, has translated many, many of the, of the Buddha's teachings from Pali into, into English. He says, speech can break lives, create enemies and start wars, or it can give wisdom, heal divisions and creates and create peace. So speech, you know, can be used for, for both great good and great harm. So for the Buddha, um, speech and communications was such an important area that he made it one of the elements, one of the factors of what's called the Noble Eightfold Path, these eight trainings to, that lead to the end of, end of suffering, you know, that come within training the mind, cultivating ethics, living wisely and compassionately, and, and developing, cultivating wisdom. You know, and what's really interesting about what I find interesting about the Buddha's teachings uh, on wise speech in the Noble Eightfold Path is that it's included there. It's not, you know, there's another element of the path called wise action and action includes kind of everything, everything else, really. Everything that isn't covered by wise speech and wise livelihood is action. And that goes from, you know, you know, how we, you know, all of the things about how we how we live our lives, you know. Um, but he does give special attention to to uh, to speech, speech and communication. But interestingly, he doesn't go into the kind of detail that he goes into in other areas. You know, he doesn't so much go into the how or the relational part of speech. You know, when we're talking about speech we're, or communication, we're communicating with someone, you know, and it's interactive typically, or a lot of the time it's one person speaking to another as part of a conversation or a discussion. Sometimes in a larger sense, it may be putting things out to people, you know, news, information, legislation, that kind of thing. But people can still respond to that and, you know, in different ways. Um, but the Buddha doesn't get into so much those aspects. He basically just provides these guidelines um, or, or prescriptions might be a good, good term for them. They're not commandments, you know, you've got to do this. They're basically, they're basically saying to us, saying to the people of this time, saying to the people of all times, um, if you want to wake up and be free, then you're not going to do it if you tell a lot of li tell lies. It's, you're not going to do it if you, you know, slander people and divide people up against the other people. You don't, you know, if you're, you know, shouting and screaming, if that's your form of speech, you're not, that's not going to, you're not going to wake up. You're not going to free your heart, find freedom from suffering in that way. Rather, it will be through cultivating kind, gentle, friendly, true speech that, that you'll free the heart, that you'll open your heart, you'll find freedom, you'll gain uh, insight that will um, allow you to kind of get off of the wheel of suffering in this, in this, um, in this life. Um, and through your speech, you'll build harmony with other people, build community too. So the Buddha, um, when he speaks of wise speech, he divides it into four main components. I'll, um, let me see, I think I'll, I'll just put these up on the screen for a minute if I can, let's see, there we go. Here we go. Do you see that? Yeah, okay. I'm gonna, just for this, I'm going to, um, there we go. Yeah, okay. There we go. 
there we go. So he has these four prescriptions to abstain from false speech, you know, to not tell lies, to, to only say what is true and not to lie for your own benefit, for the benefit of somebody else or you know, for, for any reason whatsoever, abstain from false speech. Um, he speaks, the second is to abstain from slanderous speech. You know, slanderous speech is, is speech that tells lies about people or about situations and is intended to divide. So our speech should be true, is the first. It should be um, bring people together, should be kind, generous, not slanderous. He says that abstain from harsh speech. Um, harsh speech is angry, violent kind of speech. And, um, and speak, speak with kindness, with compassion. And abstain from chatter, gossip, idle chatter and gossip which covers a whole range of different, um, you know, different ways that our speech is kind of waste time wasting, um, that it doesn't add anything, um, isn't, isn't beneficial. So I'm gonna, gonna stop sharing for a minute and I'll, I'm happy to share this later in other, other um, slides, I, um, maybe later, but, um, One of the things I just want to say a few words about each of these, um, each of these four prescriptions for how we should how we should speak. So the first, the abstaining from um, from false speech, to, um, not lying, is really to speak the truth, um, and it's really essential to living together in a way that invites mutual trust. Um, the key in all of these, um, cultivating all of these qualities of wise speech is our intention. If we said something that was untrue, but that wasn't our intention to do so, it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't violate this precept of, of, of wrong speech, of abstaining from, from false speech. It's our intention that matters. Because when we, when we lie, we cause harm to others and society, and we undermine trust in each other. You know, we undermine trust in society. I mean, we don't, you know, we can see all the ways in which in recent years, the, you know, flagrant willingness to, um, to say things that just we know aren't true, that those falsehoods are used, those lies are used to divide people. And how much, how much incredible suffering has been caused by that, by you know, denying things that you know, are, are, are completely um, provable, verifiable, you know, but it's almost like truth the actual truth doesn't matter. If I feel it's true, my, my feelings are what matter. You know, if I feel an election was stolen or I feel vaccines are a hoax, you know, it's fine for me to put that out into the world. Um, and yet the incredible harm that does, the incredible suffering it causes. So the Buddha was really concerned about, about harmony creating harmony in the society. But in terms of the Four Noble Truths, in terms of the Eightfold Path, which is part of the Four Noble Truths, the main focus, his main focus was on the ways in which acting in unskillful ways actually from, prevents us from freeing our minds. So, in this case, in terms of the Eightfold Path, the, the main priority is clear, you know, seeing clearly, 
you know, and the secondary one is creating harmony in, in the society. Um, I mean, they both obviously very much go hand in hand, but the focus of the Four Noble Truths is letting go and finding freedom from suffering. So we cause harm to ourselves um, by lying, by telling, the, the telling lies. We create division and separation within ourselves because, you know, we have to, um, you know, if we tell a lie, then we tend to have to cover it up. You know, we have to kind of remember as well, oh, what did I say to that person? Is it consistent with what I might say later or what they might find out from somewhere else? You know, so it, it, in itself, it agitates the mind. It, it contracts the mind because like we're, we're not at ease. There's not a sense of calm and well-being that's possible if we're caught up because there's an underlying fear and tension there. And Bhikkhu Bodhi says, in, in lying, we separate ourselves from the truth. And in the Buddha's teachings, this is the exact opposite of freedom. Bhikkhu Bodhi says, truthful speech is a matter of taking our stand on reality rather than, it, than illusion. So truth is fundamental to the Buddha's teachings. This central teaching is called the Four Noble Truths. It's about taking refuge taking refuge in the, you know, the, what are called the three refuges, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Dharma is truth. It's the way things are, the way life is. Um, you know, and that's obviously based on, you know, it's bigger than, but it's based on factual truth as well. It's like, you know, what happened? You know, what do we know about climate change? You know, that um, it would be dishonest if we were to take the information from thousands of scientists about the human role in climate change and then turn around, you know, and say, oh, we don't know. We don't know what the cause of climate change is or even if it's happening. You know, that would be that would be false speech. That would be dishonest speech. So we can think of lots of examples of that. But I'll move on and talk about briefly about the others and because I, I want to say something, maybe this is what I'm, I'm going to get into more next week after talking about the, the Buddhist teachings on speech this week. Um, but the second is abstaining from slanderous speech, you know, and that means avoiding speech and communication that's intended to create enmity, you know, to separate people, to alienate one person from or group from another. You know, you remember the, the story, you know, the, the story of, of um, Shakespeare's play, um, uh, Othello, you know, and uh, Iago, Iago, Iago speaking about, you know, saying false things about Othello's wife, Desdemona, or she's been unfaithful to you and creating all this kind of jealousy in his mind. And then, all, you know, all the, you know, the rest, all that follows on from that. So creating divisions and harm, slanderous speech does this. And the opposite of slanderous speech is communication that promotes harmony and friendship. And again, just to say that when we engage in this kind of divisive speech, we're not only creating harm in the world, we're creating harm in our own minds and hearts. We are in that, we're creating anger in ourselves. We're reinforcing that. We're reinforcing a sense of separation from, from, from others. And in, in doing that, we're, we're also reinforcing a sense of self and other. We're holding on to the self. I'm right, we're right, they're wrong, they're bad. You know, and we're creating suffering in that way through slanderous or, or divisive speech. The third, third area is harsh speech. Harsh speech means angry, hurtful, insulting, abusive, or offensive speech. And it comes out of anger, out of aversion. And the opposite is kind and agreeable speech. And we see this, you know, we see it very much in, in our body politic, you know, in these recent, recent years. Um, you know, both we see the lies, we see the slander, the division. And we see the angry speech, you know. I mean, you think of, you know, I don't want to get too political, but you think of all of those speeches on, you know, on the, um, 
you know, outside of the White House on, on January 6th. And then, you know, this election's been stolen, you know, we need to do something about it. And getting people riled up. And you see immediately, like as a very direct consequence of that, people breaking down doors, people attacking police. Um, and, and so there's this, um, the, the, the consequences of harsh and angry speech are so visible to us. And, you know, and, and I do want to say, I'm not saying this as to make a political point, but just to point clearly and, you know, and obviously really to the cause and effect of harsh and angry speech and the consequences in, in the world. And that says nothing of the consequences within any of the people either sharing that speech, you know, making speeches or the people that were taking it in themselves, you know, the suffering in them too how their minds and hearts are clouded by the by the the lies and by the anger and the you know the hateful rhetoric and all of that and then the final area is is abstaining from idle chatter and gossip this encompasses pointless talk that lacks thought and purpose and a lot of our speech can be like this we're kind of like filling in spaces we don't we may feel uncomfortable so much of our speech, when we're unconscious, we're unmindful or careless with our words, can be harmful. You know, we might think of it as relatively innocent. Oh, we're just sharing some information. And sharing information is, is fine. That's not in itself idle chatter or gossip. You know, you think of, you know, people in a village society meeting at the well to talk about, you know, what's going on and, you know, oh, so and so, you know, this woman's had a baby and this family has had a, an elder who has died, you know, all of that is, is not idle. There's a story, <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day when, when I was thinking about this idle chatter and gossip, I don't know what it comes into, but a story in my family is, um, is after I was born, um, uh, two of the neighbours, we lived in central London, the kind of after, the, you know, post post world war period there and um and one one neighbor said to the other oh mrs burns had another baby i put on my monty python voice for this had another baby and the other and the other person says what's his name what did she call him and then and the uh, first woman says um she called him you you and the other one says you why she call him you they're going to call him you anyway Come here, you. So this was um, this was the origin of uh, of no, not the origin of the name. I already had the name, but I I think of that as maybe not as idle chatter or gossip, but just keeping up on the on the news of you know what's what's going on around us and in the community. But idle chatter and gossip can be you know if we gossip about somebody. Oh, this person did this, this person did this bad thing and we share it with others. We create, we create dissension, we create, um, we create conflict, we create division and we create division in our own heart, in our own, in our own mind. Um, so these are the four, four um, prescriptions that the Buddha gives. And the thing I wanna say finally about these is that these, what the Buddha's teachings of wise speech really are like riverbanks. They keep us moving in the direction of freeing our hearts. Because if we lie and slander and speak angrily or harshly, it's going to be very difficult for us to, to kind of calm the mind and, and ultimately to wake up, to live, live more freely, to let go of clinging, to let go of suffering. And if we cultivate kind, generous, timely speech, then, um, then it'll lead us in the direction of, of, of our mind being calmer, more balanced, more peaceful. And then, um, and then we, can, we can let go of, um, we can let go of, of suffering. We can, we can find freedom from suffering. Um, what I wanna just mention before I finish today is just to kind of think, invite you to, to think about um, your own speech, this, um, 
maybe in the over the week ahead and think about ways in which your speech you know do you may not be you know lies as such but where you maybe shade the truth and you know don't don't you know don't say things as they really are but kind of avoid something avoid um some judgment others might feel you might um tell something that was kind of like a white lie or you know if you have a resume that you might kind of pad out you know may again may not be lies but maybe um uh maybe something that's not really the truth when we when we really touch into our own heart and into our own conscience you say no that doesn't feel right that feels doesn't feel accurate doesn't feel like it's the truth so where where in our lives are we not speaking the truth or not communicating in honest ways where are we speaking in ways where we're creating divisions are we ever doing that are we ever doing that in what we share with one person about another are we creating division where are we speaking in a way that's that's angry or hurtful where we're holding on tightly to our views you know and and in that way getting into you know, into conflict with with another person. Often in our very, you know, in our intimate relationships, so though that kind of tension can come up of like I'm right about this, and and then um, and then you know, when are we when are we saying things that aren't aren't helpful, they're not 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 useful. Um, so what the you know what the Buddha's teachings they've been they've been summarized into. Um, you know, some basic prescriptions, you know, say, you know, is it true? Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it timely? Is it the right person, the right time? Um, and think about that in our own lives. Um, what I, I, the second part of this, this, what I wanted to talk about today, and I want to spend one minute or two minutes on this, is to, um, I want to talk about a book, you know, as I mentioned, the Buddha's teachings are very, very focused on, you know, what not to do, and by implication, what we should do, but not so much the kind of back and forth of communication. And yet that's in there in the Buddha's teachings, because all of the practices of mindfulness and wise effort and concentration help us to do that. And I was going to I'm going to talk and I'll talk next week about a book by Oren J. Sofa called Say What You Mean, Say What You Mean. Um, it's called um, A Mindful Approach to Nonviolent Communication. I don't know if that's that's visible because I can't see myself on the on the say what you mean um really looked in much greater depth at our communications and how we um how by practicing mindfulness how we can engage in communications that are helpful that are kind that are necessary by by really being being grounded in our bodies aware of our emotions aware of our feelings you know when we're caught when we engage in wrong speech or unwise speech a great deal of the time we're disconnected from our bodies from our own feelings we're also disconnected probably from everything else except what we're wanting to get across so the more we can come back come back to the body you know feel your body right now feel the Feel your hands, feel that, connect with your breathing. And then to speak from that place of being grounded in the body. You know, what, what Oren Sofa speaks about this as is um, leading from presence, leading from being present. Being present in our, with ourselves in our experience helps us to engage in wise communication, wise speech, kind speech, helpful speech. And he also speaks about the second area being intentional in our speech, knowing, you know, coming from care and curiosity, being curious, partic particularly curious about, you know, 
the person or people that we're speaking to, how are they, how are they responding? What are they saying? So there's empathy, there's connection, there's deep listening. And thirdly, he, he, he says, focus on what really matters. You know, what really matters. And he looks at, you know, probably some of you, many of you are familiar with Marshall Rosenberg and his nonviolent communication. And he highlights, you know, four ways of paying attention through observations, connecting with feelings, connecting with the underlying needs we have, and speaking in, in terms of requests rather than demands. This is a very, very skillful way and how with mindfulness we can use that approach to really not only get our own needs met, but also see that the other person you know, who we might be in conflict with gets their needs met. So that's kind of, if I had an hour and an hour and 10 minutes for the talk today, that would have been kind of elaborated more, but I'll talk about that more in depth next time. And um, I'm looking at the time and I'm gonna invite Emily to lead us in some movement. And, um, and then we'll come back and do some, I think we'll do some sharing or and next week we'll do some breakouts. Thank you. So let me invite you to stand up and sway and just open out into the space around you, allowing one heel lifting while you turn the opposite direction. A gentle twist. And then come to center, opening up wide and draw your horns up, grasping your left wrist in your right hand and extend out to the right and tilt, just lengthening along that left side, breathing into the left rib cage and inhale back up to center. Then grasping the right wrist, draw the arm up and tilt to the left, allowing, breathing into that right rib cage. Exhale, lower your shoulders down and then inhale back to center. Float your arms down, moving your shoulders independently, just allowing them to draw the circle and draw it the other way. And then let's bring our arms up into cactus arms and exhale, dropping them down, inhale, lifting, exhale, dropping and lift up and drop. Bring your arms down and now roll your shoulders together and roll them the other way. And then bring your hands behind your waist. Inhale as you draw your chest up, lifting your head. Exhale, draw your arms down, hands below your waist, and then release. Inhale as you lift your chest. Exhale as you draw your hands down, lengthening your arms, and release. Float your arms up just for a moment, fly in your own dance however you might wish. And then bring your hands together at your heart. Let's take a bow to everyone who's here, honoring them. And thank you. Thank you, Emily.
want to um, mention another um, another book, and uh, maybe Michelle, you you might I'm not sure you're familiar with it, but may use it. That's called um, it is advice for future corpses um, and those who love them, a practical perspective on death and dying. Um, I'm just beginning this but I've heard great, great things about it by Sally Tisdale. Advice for future corpses around, uh, around death and dying. And uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to reading, reading that. Um, so wise speech, wise communication this week, next week. Um, I wanted to, uh, what, I wanted to share a, um, a meditation on it. And I think maybe I'll do that for the, the final meditation. Maybe kind of a meditation on speaking, um, mindfulness of speak when we're speaking and mindfulness when we're listening. You know, I, I notice, for example, when I'm, when I'm speaking or giving a talk, how, you know, it's how very easy it is to get to kind of lean ahead into the content and in the process kind of lose connection with the body and you know with with kind of really being being here you know I, I tend to kind of get excited about the themes and I find myself kind of oh yeah um, and sometimes that kind of speeds things up and so just just coming back to the body coming back to the breath you know how pausing how, how that just opening space, how that can be transforming. You know, just those simple practices of just being aware if we're speaking or if we're listening to someone, to connect with what's, what our bodily feelings, connect with our emotions, connect with our breathing, which is such a, a powerful barometer of our overall well being, connect with our intentions. You know, intentions of, you know, to be present, to, to be here. Um, you know, whether we're in the listening or the, or the speaking mode. So what I would like to do, and I think what I will do next week, we'll go back to the small groups, but for time today, just invite you to um, share if anyone has any question or observation, and you can either do it in um in uh in the chat or in the um or or live and and i'm looking at isabel's um post and she's oh, actually she shared it with me directly but i hope it's okay to share that it's on both sides of the political spectrum and yes i probably what i said didn't get that across um it, it, and if it came across as one-sided um that wasn't my intention, but my apologies in that case. Um, just a good example of that was some of you may have seen the um, article in the style section of the Washington Post a couple of days ago, where people have set up groups on um, on some at some different platforms where maybe the Facebook wouldn't let them, but on some social media platforms which are created basically to mock those who've died of COVID, but who are kind of militant anti-vaxxers. So they're people and and the subtext is they got what they deserved, you know. And yet when you see that, it's clearly an example of harsh speech, divisive speech. And it's coming from, you know, not the same side of the spectrum as the people who are saying, you know, vaccinations are too, too risky to this, and there's no science, etc. cetera. Um, but it's equally, equally angry, equally harsh. And, um, and just to acknowledge that it's not, not by any means a one-sided thing. Right now, you know, I would argue that much of the of the um, 
much of the unwise speech that's going on is kind of skewed in a in one side of the political spectrum but it's not exclusive and it's not absolutely the you know the case and in other times it could be very different you know so just so to acknowledge that because part of our unwise speech is that we get caught up in the sense of we're on a team and our team you know we want our team to win and that's kind of part of the way the society has been divided up and we find ourselves in a place where, um, you know, we're in a very dangerous place, I think, you know, saying that in as objective a way as possible. We're in a very dangerous place in terms of how things unfold in the coming years. Um, and it calls for um, a great deal of, of vigilance, a great deal of attention and care, a lot of mindfulness, but a lot of compassion and a very kind of much larger view than we get into when we're on our team. Because when we're on our team, we see the other, other team and we want to win. You know, in our team, we might think, you know, yeah, we want social justice, we want human rights, we want climate. Yeah, but still, if we're holding on, if we're creating division, we're still doing that, you know. So, um, so being able to come to a larger view, which sees, you know, as the quote from Dr. King at the beginning of, of that, um, that uh, the solutions have to have to be for all of us and they have to involve bringing us all together and right now it feels really difficult we feel very very divided from each other and there's a lot of righteousness in that we're right they're wrong you know and and to be able to see that see where we're hooked you know in our own righteousness at times and how we can let go of that and that's what these practices uh, are about. And, and it's, not easy to, it's not easy to share the teaching. It's not easy without also getting into that, you know, of this versus that. And so it's always, you know, I know people have left my class and other people's classes because, you know, I don't want to hear about politics in meditation class. And I, I clearly don't want to come in here and talk about it. And yet we're right in the middle of something that's very, you know, that, that has a huge impact on all our lives. So it's not so much not doing it, but doing it in a way that's skillful, that doesn't push people away, that doesn't exclude. And so that's always the intention, even though sometimes, you know, I would certainly put myself in this bracket, you know, we get caught up, we get caught up in our view, we get caught up in our team, but how to come back, how to keep opening wider and wider so that it's inclusive, because that's the only way we're going to, you know, as a, as a country and as a world, we're going to move towards, you know, towards healing and, uh, and, and towards living together in a way that's, you know, that's kind and appropriate. So anyway, that's kind of an additional few words on this. But, uh, Bettina's to everyone, if a friend does a lot of idle chatter because she's uncomfortable with silence or depth at times, is it best to just accept this gently and allow her to continue this way? I feel like it addressing it but then worry I, I will seem critical or making a judgment or imposing my preferred converse, conversational agenda. I've just been going along with it, but it does frustrate me internally. It's a really, really great question, Bettina. Um, not, not, not one that I have a, an easy answer to because it, you know, it would be a, a, a kind of a lot of back and forth and exploration, but a, a couple of things I would share about it. Um, you know, I think silence, unless silence is in itself conveying something, which can be the case, I, I think in some ways, just if we do keep quiet, I'm not saying do it all the time, but if we do keep quiet, in a way, it's like the person is, the, the mirror is shining, you know, they're looking in a mirror and what they see in the mirror is themselves. So they may, through the silence, become more aware. The Buddha talked about, like, if somebody sends you, he was asked, if somebody sends you, if somebody is angry with you, 
how do you respond? And then the Buddha, very incredible response. He said, well, what happens if somebody sends you a letter and, um, and you don't want the letter, what happens? Well, in those days, they didn't have a postal service, but the person who brought the letter, you'd say to them, no, I don't want that letter. What happens to the letter? It goes back to the person that sent it, you know, and the, and the Buddha, you know, the, the person that was inquiring of the Buddha, you know, says, yeah, that goes back. Well, the same, if somebody sends anger to you and you don't respond, where does it go back to? You know, they're much more in a position of being able to say, oh, I'm really angry now because you're not reinforcing the anger. You're not fighting with the anger. So that's one. So so the first piece really, I think, is <coughs> just not not responding can be part of 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 kind of helping the person to see without giving them a lecture, you know. You shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't just be rambling off, running off at the mouse type of thing. Um, that's one piece and just how to work with that skillfully. Another piece is, you know, in as kind and a, as compassionate a way as possible, you know, speak about your own feelings, you know, speak in the language, you know, as Marshall Rosenberg, speak, talk, you know, talks about in his book nonviolent communication, speak in observations, you know, what are you observing when this person, you know, keeps, you know, gossiping or, or you know, engaging in idle chatter, you can, you can observe that and say that without evaluation, without judgment, just as cleanly and as clearly as you can. And then you can speak about how you feel. You know, if it's if you feel sad or if you feel bored or if you feel angry, just to say it from your own perspective without blaming them. Yo, you did this to me. But just saying when when you said this or when you said this the last few times, I felt. Whatever that might be, you know, I mean, what might that be? That might be I felt. Um, you know, in some way disconnected because. You know, I'm not sure I'm wanting to be hearing, you know, um, some of these things. I'm not, you know, what the invitation would be to say, what, what is it that, you know, I mean, I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to, to just say it now, um, if, you know, just do it in person now, Bettina, I mean, I wonder what, what the, you know, what is it that you were feeling that was, you know, you said, I think you were a little, the last thing you said was, um, that you're feeling some fr frustration. Is it possible to say that, you know? I'm, you know, I, I'm feeling frustrated because I, I'm wanting to have other kinds of connection with you. You know, and when we take, speak about connection, we're talking about our needs, you know? So, so I'm, I'm wanting connection, but I'm not feeling very connected with you when you talk about, you know, X or Y, you know? And so in that way, you say, what your experience is, you're not judging them or blaming them. And, and it takes skill. It's not necessarily easy when we first practice in this way. And then, you know, that's second, first observations, feelings, needs underneath the feelings. What, what am I really needing here? And then uh, requests. You know, and obviously we can have conversation about the com about the way we're talking to each other, and then the request. You know, um, you know whatever that might be. You know, to you know, can we can we be more focused? Can we be focused on you know our own our own connection with each other, or, or something that it affirms the relationship, but you know, in a non-blaming and a non-judging way. Does that make, make sense? It's a lot more to be said about that, but those are some of the kind of beginning things. Yeah, thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's doable. Um, so that's given me a lot of help. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bettina. And I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a response from Gary to Ru Ruan, Ruan um, wondering about the dilemma of not telling the whole truth if you think it hurts someone's feelings or upsets them. For example, if somebody asks your opinion about an all, uh, the color of an item they own and you find it awful, 
is truth saying what you really think or being polite and diplomatic and saying it is nice? That's a wonderful question. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I think that's a really ugly, ugly color and an awful coat. And I think you look terrible. <laughs> I, I don't think that would be a wise way to go in terms of the communication. But you also don't want to say, you know, if you do think it looks kind of strange or weird or awful, it wouldn't be appropriate to say, oh, you look great. You know, oh, I think beautiful. You know, that would be dishonest, wouldn't it? So what would be skillful? What would be skill a skillful way? You know, maybe a kind way of, you know, it might just be your opinion, you know, purple and green aren't my combinations, my chosen combinations, you know, or scarlet and whatever, you know, maybe that's not my color or something, you know, to make it a much more neutral, perhaps, you know, less judgmental. I mean, just to, we don't have to say everything that's in our minds. And and we do want to have, if somebody is really genuine, look, genuine, genuinely looking for our opinion, I think um, giving our opinion, um, you know, but without it being like, oh, you look terrible in that, or that's an awful color, to say, you know, may it say from your opinion, you know, that's not, you know, that's not what I would wear, you know, or that's not a color that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly fond of, because a lot of that, a lot of what we wear is subjective and it's, you know, it, and it's also fashion. It's what, you know, what the agreed sense of what's okay and what's not okay. And, and um, you know, it, it's a lot about what, what, you know, what the implications are. What are the deeper needs here? You know, what's the deeper need in this, um, in this, in this conversation that we're, that we're having? Um, Yeah, Rachel, your question, what's a good way to deal with a situation where someone is gossiping but is clearly hurt by something and needs to vent? <clears throat> How can you be compassionate to that person without, without getting, getting drawn in? You know, I have a particular view about venting. I personally, um, again, some people feel that, you know, venting gets something out of the system and is helpful. I tend not to see that. I tend to, if we're, it, particularly if we're into getting into blaming or judging, that person is that, they're like that, they're like that, they're like, they're horrible, they're always mean, they're terrible. I feel the more that we say that and the more we repeat it, the more it becomes part of our consciousness, really, you know. Um, it, it, it's kind of, I don't think it goes, I don't think it just goes, well, oh, I just needed to kind of let go of that. I mean, I, I would invite, you know, the person to explore, you know, if there may be a, other ways of, 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 you know, relieving themselves of what they're feeling. I mean, you know, maybe just you know engaging in 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 a kind conversation with them i mean sometimes there's not a lot we can say you know because what we say might be you know be taken in as oh you're judging me or you know you're making me wrong or you're making me the bad person in this or you're saying something about the other thing when your intention may well be just to you know, what is it, what is, you, you know, what is your need at that particular time in the conversation? Can you convey that to the person um, speaking about what your feelings are in a way that's kind and really accurate, you know, in terms of observations of what you're noticing? So these are, the, I mean, any of these, probably you could spend a whole half hour or more on any, any one question because, you know, Communications are really are really complex, and we're only certainly only, um, you know, in a way, kind of scratching the surface 
um, surface here, but um, invite you, definitely invite you to, um, you know, if you're interested in this area, if you're interested in exploring mindful communication, you know, and how to get less caught up in speech and communication is to check out um, Oren Sofa's book, Oren J. Sofa, Say What You Mean, um, a mindful approach to nonviolent communication. You could also check out Marshall Rosenberg, his book called NVC or Nonviolent Communication, The Language of Life. Um, and the other book I mentioned was in Advice for Future Corpses, but that's not so much about speech and communication. So maybe we'll um, leave the sharing part for now. And what I'd like to do is to have a, um, a short final meditation. And what I'll do there is um, in the meditation, at the end of the meditation, or the last part of the meditation, is, is share some reflections from a wonderful Burmese teacher, U Tejaniya Sayadar, which means like an abbot's uh, Sayadar, U Tejaniya, relax and be aware is the name of the book. His name is U Tejaniya and we'll share that. But um, this is just um, his reflections on awareness while listening. But before doing that, let's just sit for a couple of minutes, let yourself, let yourself settle again. It's dropping back into your body, bringing awareness to your breathing. Being aware of the contact of your body with the chair or the floor. And just connecting with your breathing, breathing in, breathing out. Just opening to whatever is present right now. And I'll share this um, since you're in somewhat of a listening mode right now. I'll share this reflection from Utejaniya on awareness while listening. And so doing it while I'm sharing this, maybe give you some thoughts about how you can do this in daily life. He says, keep your attention on yourself when you're listening to someone speak. This doesn't mean to stay with the stories your mind is telling or with your desire to speak or to stay silent. It means staying with your awareness of everything that's happening in your mind and body as you listen. So staying with awareness of everything that's happening in your mind and body as you listen. Notice everything you can. Be interested and learn. Notice your thoughts, your feelings, your posture, your breath, your facial expression how you're holding your arms and hands, everything. If you put too much attention on the other person when they're speaking, then there's not enough attention for yourself. When you stay with your awareness when the other person is speaking, you'll still hear the other person and can follow what they're saying but you'll also be able to notice many other things that are happening in awareness. If a person says something that makes you angry, that's their business. There's never a good reason to be angry. Instead of attaching to the words that arouse your anger, Get interested in your 
reactivity instead. Study and learn. Watch the anger. Notice what happens in the body and mind during the process of anger. Get interested in this process. What leads to what? How are the thoughts, physical sensations and perceptions all related in the overall emotion of anger? Notice what happens to anger when you get interested and simply watch and learn from anger in this way instead of reacting to it. Does it get stronger or weaker or stay the same? Keep watching and learning. In this way, we learn how to know when is the right time to speak and what is the right thing to say before we say it. We can stay aware with wisdom before we speak, while we are speaking and after we speak. If we have a strong desire to convey something, we have eagerness in the mind and we can easily get carried away by our thoughts and speech. We need to be very careful of this energy to watch it and not react to it. The mind is very agitated and reactive. It's better not to speak. Instead, just watch the agitation and the reaction and calm yourself down first. If we're speaking, if we speak while we're reacting, we have a tendency to shoot our mouth off. Be extra vigilant when you start speaking about yourself, because this is when you're most likely to get carried away. The Buddha said that when you're silent, know that you're silent. And when you're speaking, know you're speaking. This is how to practice. If awareness is present while you're speaking, you'll find that you feel good after you've finished, after you've finished. The mind will be at ease. If you're aware with wisdom every time you speak, you'll feel more confident and sure about yourself. Even if you make a mistake, you'll know it and learn a lesson from it immediately. You'll decide how to do it next time so that you're prepared. It's not so much about whether we want to speak or not. It's about whether the situation merits that we should speak or not. Wisdom must be the guide. David White says, enough, these few words are enough. If not these words, this breath, if not this breath, this sitting here, this opening to the life we've refused again and again until now. So I hope that some of this was helpful. And if anything wasn't, you can leave it behind. You don't have to take it with you. And we'll share just a couple of things, uh, announcements before we finish. Um, I just mentioned a couple of things. One, if anyone is interested in um, knowing more or getting involved in the um, activities this week, please just send me an email or let me know in the chat, and maybe leave your email in the chat. Um, also, I want to mention that I'm one of the teachers on the New Year's retreat. Um, coming up at the New Year's, 26th of December to 1st of January, and it's going to be online, and it's an opportunity to practice together in community, but in one's own space. So if you're interested in that, um, please check that out on the IMCW website. And 
Um, I've got a day long coming up on November 6th on working with practicing with the Eightfold Path. Um, so um, we'll share, share that too. That's on the IMCW website. And I think that's what um, we're teaching a retreat in Ireland in the summer if you're thinking about traveling again. Um, uh, Rebecca and I are teaching together in uh, the west of Ireland in County Mayo, County Mayo. And um, check, uh, check that out on my, my website. Or, um, that's not on IMCW, but it's on mine. And uh, just to mention, as we do, that there's no cost for the cut class, but you're invited if you're able and inclined to make a donation. Donation goes to the teacher, in this case, me. And it's how the teachings have come down through 2,500 years and 